Yep, yeah, just uh, seconds away from eight o'clock. So welcome to another session of the uh, British Physics Olympiad round one training as such. Um, so this uh, kind of reads slightly oddly because in fact, we're not uh, training you. Uh, you're uh, using this opportunity to develop those skills yourself. So uh, watching Andy uh, sort of uh, fluently uh, traveling through these questions is wonderful but it doesn't actually uh, make you do them any better. So you've got to take the ideas, jot them down, you know, uh, you know, jot the diagram down whilst it's there and then annotate it yourself and take action. Um, he will get slicker and slicker and you will be left trailing in his wake unless you actually do these things yourself. So it's very important. You've got the pencil and paper there, lots of scrap paper and just have a go at doing them. Okay, so good luck with this, and uh, over to Dr. French. There's no pressure there, I think. <laughs> good <laughs> evening, everybody, and welcome <laughs> to BFO Round 1 Training. Um, I'm Dr. French French, uh, that was Professor Robin Hughes, and uh, and welcome. Um, so if this is your first visit, uh, uh, British Physics Olympiad, uh, we think this is the sort of gold standard of uh, what you want to aspire for for physics. And so um, this will help you... Um, for now and in the future, regardless of where you are, whether you're doing your GCSEs or if you're uh, just knocking on the door available. Um, so uh, a little starter first, um, if you have the eagle eyed, um, if we have two electrons of mass M electron and uh, uh, you have to look up what these numbers are, um, and, uh, we've got the standard constants. Does anyone know what the ratio between the electric force of repulsion and the gravitational force of attraction? Um, does anyone actually want to have uh, calculated that so far? We'll put those numbers in the chat. The numbers are doubly interesting, perhaps for people who have studied Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I'll just give you a, a few seconds if you've if you've done that calculation. If not, maybe you're amused and interested. What have we got, Nina? Uh, we have <laughs> 10 to the 38. We have 42. Oh, 42. Well, there is a 42 in it, uh, but it's uh, it's a bit more than 42 itself. Um, so if we do this, in fact, what's quite interesting is, is, is there firstly, is there, if you've even not, if you just literally just had a look at it, is there any dependency on range, the ratio of the two forces? I'll have a yes or no for that one. No dependency on range. Right, because they are both inverse square laws. Fantastic. So if you do that ratio, we've got some... Um, e squared over four pi epsilon naught. This is the strength of electrical fields. We'll just look at this in more detail if you've never seen this before, but those of you in the sixth form probably will. And we're going to divide that by the sort of strength of the gravitational force and the square of the mass of the electrons. This is a number. He's involving fundamental constants. And interestingly, the number is 4.2 times 10 to the 42. So there we go. Uh, 42 crops up in all sorts of uh, uh, serendipitous ways. Um, it's also the answer to the ultimate question, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. But uh, um, yes, uh, this is one of the more impressive instances of 42. Um, and I guess the key thing there is uh, is the power. So uh, this is why electrical forces are so much more impressive than gravitational ones. We need an entire planet. And if you leap up in the air and score a basketball shot, we can pretty much defy gravity temporarily. But that's not the case for electrical forces, which bind us all together. So there we go. Uh, an enormous number and involving 42. Uh, we're going to do mostly mechanics today, um, but we're going to begin uh, with a sort of stellar example. So um, uh, and just before we start, in terms of particularly if you're new to this, um, uh, the Web page for this one uh, recommends a sort of I've, I've kind of deconstructed uh, the 2022 paper and we're going to be wandering through that for the next few sessions. Um, and uh, what I recommend doing is printing that out. Don't worry if you haven't done that. That's uh, not a problem. Um, get a piece of paper, as Professor Hughes uh, mentioned earlier. Um, but for maximum enjoyment, um, if you print out one question per page, maybe have a go at the sort of four that we're going to do next week. And I'll, I'll, I'll give a I'll, I'll give you a sort of an idea of what those might be. But just having a go at that paper would be a really good idea. Right. So let's start with O. So this is about the Stefan Boltzmann law. So I'm just going to go and uh, uh, scroll to that one. Could, could someone actually maybe quickly type in the chat what the Stefan Boltzmann law is uh, or what's it about? Let's uh, scroll down to O, which is down here. There we go. What have we got? What do you think the Stefan Boltzmann law is about? There we go. Here we are. Right. Well, the answer is now. I mean, what have we got in the chat, Nina? Um, relates luminosity to temperature and area. Fantastic. Now, and interestingly, this is, goes as temperature to the fourth. 
It's a fourth power law. OK, very interesting derivation that we won't be doing the derivation today. But let's uh, let's de let's sort of deconstruct this question. It's a ratio question. Seems like a really large bit of text, this one, which may be sort of formidable. But actually, this is one of the easier questions to do. So let's see if we can figure it out. So firstly, uh, let's sort of deconstruct some meaning. So Stefan Boltzmann law, uh, power goes as R squared T to the four. So um, let's just go and write that down. OK, so uh, we can say, OK, this is what we know. So power P is some constant times R squared T to the four. And what we're we talking about with R and T. Well, let's go and draw ourselves a a sort of star here, okay, just to remind us what this is all about. And I think sort of drawing pictures like this doesn't take too long, but it really gets your mind in the topic. What sort of problems have we done before? All right, so a little bit of a displacement activity. So that's what R is. There's also the important thing of defining your universe, okay? <laughs> in this case, it's a spherical star, okay, of temperature T. That's in Kelvin, all right, okay? Not Kevin, but Calvin. Right. So, OK. And now what's the other thing? We've got a Wien's displacement law. OK, uh, it says the wavelength lambda max corresponding to the peak value of the emitted power of the spectrum. Right. OK, let's uh, talk about what that spectrum means. But basically, we've got lambda max uh, goes as one over T to the four. So it's inversely proportional to the absolute surface temperature. So that's a lot of text which we can turn into math. Mar. And what we can say is we can say that lambda max all right, some wavelength, uh, if you're not sure what spectrum means, we do know there's a wavelength here, and that goes as one over the absolute temperature. All right, so K and B are constants. Now, we're not giving those constants yet, but we know that sort of deconstructs this statement. So uh, it says it talks about the peak wavelength of 500 nanometers, okay? And we're trying to sort of work out the power of this red giant that the sun might become, uh, given that it's swelling up its radius and its power output goes up. Well, OK, so basically now we've just got a kind of mathematical ratio exercise. Um, so I think what we'll do is we'll work it through, not really knowing what the word spectrum means and just using the maths here. So that lots of you, of course, will know what that means. So let's we'll do this sort of almost uh, kind of blind, as it were, just looking at the mathematics. And then we'll kind of uh, try and explain a bit more where this comes from. All right. So uh, what have we got? We've got the power formula and the peak wavelength formula. So what we can do is we can write these out for the two situations. So what I would do, I'd say something like this. I go for lambda max and slightly cumbersome notation, but I put a little circle with a dot, which means the sun. So it's the same constant B. Uh, we've got. Uh, so what have we got? We've got. Um, well, actually, we, we kind of need the power here. All right. So let's uh, firstly. Let's so even before we do this, um, we haven't got our temperature here. Uh, we've just got power. Right. So the temperature is not mentioned here, is it? It's just got the peak wavelength. So we've got a lambda max and we've got a power and a radius. So. Right. Apparently I dropped out there. Um, when did I drop out, guys? Welcome back, Andy. Yes, you disappeared <laughs> completely for a while. Oh, yes, gosh. How long have I just been? Five minutes. Oh, you're joking. Oh, my goodness me. Right. I do apologize. Um, so, yeah, um, if someone could give me a ring on my mobile, if that happens again. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <We'll> change your <laughs> number. <laughs> uh, OK. All right. So, uh, right, guys, I really apologize for that. I've only just uh, figured that out myself. OK. Um, am I live now? Can you hear me? Yeah. OK, so, so you can hear um, and see. Yeah, right. OK, right. So I don't know quite where um, I dropped out. If that's been five minutes, I do apologize. Um, yeah. So <laughs> fairly yeah, early way of... on in this uh, Wien, uh, Wien's law. Right. OK. So, yeah, we need to find a way of uh, let me know if that happens, because I, I have no way of seeing. Um, OK, so. OK, guys. So we'll go through that again. So uh, what we've got is uh, we're going through our sort of our text here. And we've sort of dis we've sort of distilled that our power goes as R squared T to the four. All right, R being the uh, radius of our red giant here. OK, um, so uh, we can sort of talk about this without really knowing much about what a spectrum means. We can just look at this mathematically. So our peak wavelength of the light coming from our, our star turns out to be one over the absolute temperature. So we can write constants here, constant of proportionality, K and B. All right. So um, basically, our temperature is not mentioned um, in our our paragraph. So what we need to do is eliminate it. So what we can do is we can rearrange our Stefan Boltzmann law uh, in terms of power. And then that uh, gives us our uh, our temperature here. 
which we can then substitute into our formula for lambda max. And essentially the key tip for this and most of these things is staying algebraic is a really good idea. All right. So um, uh, if as soon as you start to stick in some numbers, we start to lose the structure. So lambda max is B over P over KR squared to the quarter. And we can simplify that a little bit. We can say it's B times KR squared over P to the power of a quarter. So if we simplify that again, because um, we're going to be doing some ratios here, uh, we've got a constant BK to the quarter times R to the half over P to the one over four. All right. So basically, that's uh, that's now going to be something we can do a ratio with. So what we're interested in um, is finding out the ratio of lambda max, the peak wavelength for our sun and our red giant. So if we just rewrite this for each one, uh, can I confirm, am I still live, guys? Yep. You are live. <laughs> I'm going to get rather paranoid now. So um, I will uh, I'll leave my, my phone on to see if someone can give me a text if there's an emergency. Uh, we don't no. have your number. Oh, right, okay. If you don't change. mind, guys, I'm not going to give that live. I, 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 I have I have Andy's number. Excellent. Wonderful. <laughs> Excellent. We have we have comms. Good, good. Right. So um, so if I have if I write an exp this expression we just derived for the peak wavelength, all right, in terms of a symbol I can use for the sun, a little circle, the dot and RJ for my red giant. You can see they look the same things, but with different R and P values. Now, what we've got are the ratios of the radii of the red giant to that of our sun and the red giant to that of our sun for power. So if we divide one by the other, we can cancel the constant that we don't know. And now we're left with a ratio of the radii to the power of half and the powers to the power of a quarter. And if you put those numbers into a calculator, you'll get about 1.778. So it's a really simple idea that we've got the wavelength maximum for our sun, which is about 500 nanometers, right in the middle of the visible spectrum, multiplied by 1.778. And you'll get something which is at the top end of red. So it's sort of between the deep red and infrared. And uh, there we go. Hence the hence the red giant. So there we go. So um, mathematically, um, also, I suppose, in a physics perspective, staying algebraic is kind of the key here. All right. Um, so um, I did say we'd have a little look at what that spectrum means. So if you actually have a look at light from uh, an object, it's one known as the black body spectrum. But of course, <laughs> You know, this is any sort of uh, uniformly radiating object that's, uh, that's sort of a perfect emitter, if you like. And if you plot wavelength against intensity, now I think I'll rephrase what that means. That's going to be power per square meter per wavelength, which may sound like an odd thing to write. But the idea is we take light and we stick it through a sort of prism and split it up. And then we can detect um, you know, the light at different wavelengths. I think it was an amount of sort of refraction. And what you'll find is it basically goes up and then comes down like this. All right. And the shape of this spectrum, uh, which is, uh, I think it's probably determined by uh, a certain Max Planck, uh, is really crucial to the theory of quantum mechanics. Um, but from our perspective, uh, lambda max, okay, is this uh, corresponds to the peak intensity. Uh, and interestingly enough, OK, the peak intensity, it goes as one over uh, the temperature and the uh, basically the area under this graph, OK, which would be the power per unit area. So the power per meter squared is going to be proportional to the fourth power of temperature. So the higher the temperature, the area gets bigger. And the reason why uh, we've got R squared, of course, is because we basically got for a star. Here's our star, our radius R. Well, the power or the luminosity, all right, it's going to be 4 pi r squared times, well, the constant is called the Stefan Boltzmann constant, sigma t to the 4. All right, so that's where it all comes from. That's why it's r squared t to the 4. Good stuff, that. All right, okay, um, I still live. Yes. Fantastic. <laughs> right. OK, so uh, the next one, um, I think I suggested we do. Let's just see what my list was. Uh, I think it was O O R E W. Let me write that down. So O R E and W. So let's go and do R next. So we're going to change tack entirely. And we're going to talk about pendulums. So um, if you could type in the chat what the formula for the period of a pendulum is, that'd be amazing. There we go. That's number R. 
his question. Right, what have we got, Nina? We have 2 pi times the square root of L over G. Fantastic. Excellent. Good. This is a, a good one to derive, but also um, a good one to actually know. So let's just draw a pendulum here. Here we go. Here's a pendulum. All right, here's the angle. And let's have a sort of mass on it of mass M. And uh, there we go. That length is L. OK. All right. So um, this is swinging around. And we're in a gravitational field of strength G. So the period T is 2 pi root L on G. And it might be just worth exploring that a little bit, what that means. So if we were to sort of uh, let our, our, our pendulum go, we could plot the angle versus time. And that would form for small angles, at any rate, a sort of cosine or soidal variation. And the time period for one of those oscillations would be t. So if that was, say, theta naught, our, our sort of uh, maximum or theta max, perhaps. All right. Our release point, we might say theta max. Uh, so theta is theta max times the cosine of two pi radians, same as 360 degrees, times the number of periods. So t over the period. And that would actually be the mathematical form of that uh, cosine of the curve. All right. So, so that's how we turn a, we use what we call a mass, a harmonic form. Essentially, it's how we can co-opt a cosine uh, variation, uh, which is a, you know, has one period with two pi radians or 360 degrees um, into something involving time. So there we go. Uh, that's our that's our period of a pendulum for small oscillations. All right. And another way of having a look at that is we might just see, well, if T is basically some function of mass, length and gravity, strength of gravity, we could put some constants on there. Let's go for A, B and C. All right. With some sort of constant in the front of it. Let's call that K. And we could say, well, the dimension T all right, must be the dimensions of all the other things. OK, so the dimensions of mass must be kilograms to the power A. We've got length, which is meters to the power B. And we've got meters per second squared, ms to minus 2, to the power C. All right, times So we can ignore the constants. That means dimensions of. OK, this is an aside, by the way. <laughs> but uh, uh, given we're sort of, uh, you know, sort of teaching about these things. All right. So um, if we look at those dimensions, well, the dimensions of T are going to be seconds. So if we look at the dimensions of distance, mass and time. All right. We can work out what the powers are. So if we do kilograms first, well, on the, uh, the sort of left hand side, the time side, there's nothing. There are no kilograms. And we've got um, A on that side. So A must be zero. If we look at, say, uh, meters, so distance, we've got nothing on the uh, on the time side um, and we've got B um, plus C. OK, so therefore uh, C is minus B. And if we look at the top, the second side, we've got one on the uh, dimension side because that has the dimensions of seconds. So seconds is equal to that. And what have we got? We've got um, a minus two C. All right, so therefore C must be minus a half, and therefore B must be a half. So I hope that if you put that together, therefore the formula for T is some constant. There's no dependency on mass. Um, L, which is B, which is a half, and G downstairs, and we've got a square root. So there we go, purely on dimensional grounds. Now there is a dimensional question, I think, in BFO round one this year. Um, we can actually get the formula without doing any other physics, right? So things have got to be dimensionally correct. Anyway, that's an aside, hence in the square brackets. So let's have a look at the question. So it says it has a period of one second. However, the clock runs slow by 10 minutes each day. What percentage change should be made in the length of the pendulum? Right, so um, let's just recast that in terms of some algebraic forms. Can I just check, are we live? Yes. Good. <laughs> so, right. So I'm going to need to invent some symbology here. So let's go and do that. So we've got period T. So T is too long uh, by delta T seconds. All right. So T naught uh, equals 1.0 seconds is desired. All right. Right. OK, so what do we got? Uh, we've got a length. So let L 
uh, equals some length we originally started plus delta L. Now, the reason what we're doing is we're trying to sort of recast the problem with some algebra, all right? And delta, so delta L is the thing that we're interested in. So delta L, change in L, uh, is the change, okay, which reduces, right, T to T naught, okay? So that's kind of unpacks the problem, all right? So we've got a, t a time, all right, which is too long, and we want to reduce the time back to T naught by making the pendulum longer. All right, so let's just go and write that out. What does that mean? Well, it means that T naught plus delta T are sort of uh, are going slow. We know what that is. All right, um, is going to be two pi square root of L naught divided by G. All right, so that's kind of what we want. That, that's what that's what the system is at the moment. All right, it's gone slow. And we want so that's that's involving you know our, our length. So that's what L naught is for the slow pendulum, right? So that's the default situation. So this is a slow pendulum of length L naught. Okay. Uh, so if we reduce that by making our uh, our length larger, we can say well then T naught is going to be two pi square root of L naught plus delta L. All right, over G. OK, so that's kind of the idea. All right. Uh, let's just check that we are got the right thing. For it. So it's a clock runs slow by 10 minutes each day. It's losing time. All right. So delta T is going to be negative. Um, so there we go. So that's uh, that, that needs that thing needs to be larger to make that happen. OK, so there we go. Um, what else do we want? <clears throat> what else do we know rather? Well, we know that delta T over T naught, so a ratio, so it says it's 10 minutes each day. So that's going to be 10 times 60 divided by 24 times 3,600. So I'm doing the ratio of seconds. And if you work that out, that's 1 over 144, okay, 1 over 12 squared. Right. What else do I want to know? So I want to work out what do I actually want to find out here. Let's just look at the question. What percentage change should be made to the length of the pendulum? So what that means is, all right, using my new notation, that's what is delta L divided by L naught. OK, that's what I want to find out. So now we've got a mathematical goal. We want to find the ratio delta L to L naught. Um, and we've got a formula involving T naught delta T. We know the ratio of delta T to T naught. Uh, now we've got a math puzzle. OK, so I guess the tough bit of this is is using the right notation in order to solve our mathematical puzzle. And to be honest, that is fairly true of, of almost all of, of physics problems. All right, so how do we get to, we generate the maths? Okay, um, before I carry on and solve this, has anyone got any queries about how I've set this up? Do you wanna pop those into the chat, please? I can take a slurp of water. Anything coming up? Yeah, some people are asking why you're using two different deltas. Oh, right. Oh, yeah. Uh, good point. That's rather an eccentric choice, isn't it? So, um, all right. <laughs> let's pick one, shall we? Uh, let's go for the little one, shall we? Um, yeah, let's go for a little one. That's an eccentric choice. There we are. Okay. How's that? <laughs> all right. Okay. And I'll, I'll fix that one too. Yeah. I mean, there are sort of, you know, there are some conventions. A, a, a delta, the way I've written lowercase, means usually a small change, whereas you might have a big delta as a, a modest one. There's, there are probably formal other things. But let, let, let's be consistent so we're not confusing. So uh, what we want to do is we uh, we can work out that fraction. So I think it seems logical here that we want to divide by T naught. OK, so let's go and do that, shall we? So if we divide one by the other, let's just label those equations. We go for one divided by two. What have we got? Uh, so we've got one plus delta t over t naught. The two pi's cancel. Uh, the root g's cancel. And upstairs we've got l naught. And downstairs we've got our, uh, l naught plus delta l. Okay. Uh, so if we kind of divide top and bottom by root l naught, that's going to be one over. Uh, and uh, what we can do is we can sort of factor out the l naught, and what we've got is the square root of one plus delta L over L naught. 
that's too much in one go, I'll do that in a separate stage. Let's go and do that, shall we? So if I can take L0 up the top and down the bottom, if I factor out the root L0, all right, I've got one plus delta L over L0. I can put that to the half. Okay, so these top and bottom cancel. So what I've got is one plus the ratio of the lengths. Okay, to the minus a half. Now, uh, what, what, what do I actually want? I want the ratio of the lengths. So all I have to do, I'll make that a little bit smaller so we can see, see the sort of progress here. So therefore, if I square in, uh, you know, in reciprocate, I've got one plus delta L over L naught equals one plus the ratio of my times. So a fractional increase in pendulum uh, period uh, to the power of minus two. OK, um, and then all I need to do is take one from that. So my final answer, the thing I want to calculate, the fractional increase in length is going to be this quantity here. Minus one. Now, in the BFO mark scheme for this, it says, oh, you can use a binomial expansion. and We can have done it earlier. Um, you can if you like, but I think it's quite nice to have it exact. Uh, if we did a binomial expansion, if you know what that is, uh, delta T over T naught is much less than one. So that's approximately one uh, minus two delta t over t naught minus one, which is approximately minus two delta t over t naught. Uh, so if you can do that, if you like, it won't make a huge difference, but let's do it perfectly. Um, delta L over L naught is going to be one plus one over one four four. That's what we calculated earlier to the minus two minus one. If you put that into a calculator, you'll get uh, minus 0 0.014. OK, so we're going to shorten it by 1.4 percent. OK, so there we go. And uh, the last thing I want to do is I've done some calculations. I've gone into maths land. Does that make sense? So I'm going to shorten my pendulum. I'm going to make L smaller. What does that do to the time? Well, it's going to make the period longer because I go as root L and it's lost time by 10 minutes uh, in a day. So my period's gone down. I need to get make, make increase again. So I've got to make my pe my pendulum uh, smaller. OK, so there we go. That's um, that hopefully that makes that makes sense. Um, any questions on, on what we've just done? Any questions in the chat? I guess there are a bunch which we're going through. Um, somebody's asking when you have the two T zero equations, why did you move Delta T to the root from the top to the bottom equation, which I'm not sure exactly where it's referring uh, to. Okay, yeah, I think we can, so if we go to the map. So, um, so okay. what we've got, so um, if we start from what I've labeled as equations one and two, so just make sure we've got that right. We know it's root L on G times two pi is the period of my pendulum. Um, so we've got the kind of, the, pe the pendulum period of one second or whatever that is, you know, that's 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 what we want. Um, we know that's changed um, as a result of, uh, well, it, it going slow. All right. So the change in T, we could have put a minus sign, actually, if you really wanted to, because, you know, it is is losing time. Um, but we can kind of keep it general if you like. Um, and uh, so uh, our period has, uh, you know, it's uh, it's it's got so it's got some as it say, it's lost. Yes, there we go. So uh, the clock runs slow by 10 minutes each day. All right. So there we go. Um, it's taking longer than uh, than one second to tick. Um, and then we've got another equation, which is if we change the length of our pendulum, all right, we get back to the original period. So that's why we've set those up. OK, so delta T is definitely a positive thing. Our, uh, our pendulum period is it's going slow. So that means the time it takes to tick is going to be more than one second. Uh, it's one hundred forty fourth of a second plus one. That's the new that's the new period of my pendulum. Um, so um, if we just divide one by the other, we want ratios, you see. So we've we've already got that ratio um, that's defined. And what we want, we want the fractional increase. OK, so that's hopefully that motivates that algebra by given we want the ratio given the ratio delta t to t naught. However, if you don't write those things down to start off with, it's kind of hard to know what you're aiming for. So again, like the first problem, and like all of these, 
if we write down an algebraic statement involving quantities that are either defined directly in the question or more importantly we have to make up that's what makes this a bit more of a challenge uh that's kind of the, the pro that's how we progress make progress okay so um we're going to move on to something rather different uh which is going to be looking at some uh uh, some momentum calculations, which is rather nice. So we're going to go to question E. OK, so I'm just going to go back. Uh, sorry, it's going to scroll a little bit more. There we go. I will do some electricity questions at some point. <laughs> if that's your thing. Um, <laughs> everything's good. Everything's good. Right. OK, F. Here we are. E. Right. So um, E and also uh, W, which we'll hopefully we'll do at the end. Uh, are kind of both momentum questions. And I, I don't know, I really like momentum questions. There's something rather beautiful about it. It's sort of before and after, all right? The details of what happens in the middle um, doesn't really matter so much. Um, so what's going on? I've got a particle of mass M1, initial speed U makes an elastic collision. It's a good keyword. All right, perhaps in the chat, you can write down what that means. With a stationary particle of mass M2, they move off at two speeds at equal angles either side of an initial uh, instant direction of m1 right so this is a momentum problem and there is a this is a this is sort of a paradigm kind of thing we want a before and an after diagram but firstly um what is an elastic collision what does that mean what have we got in the chat chat is saying kinetic energy conserved fantastic so even better the speed of approach is equal to the speed of separation um, but let's go and sort of see how that works out. So uh, let's go for the before diagram. You really, I can't insist enough that a good idea to do this. So before, what we've got, we've got mass one, all right, and it's moving at velocity u, okay, and m2 is stationary. All right, what happens after? All right, let's give this a go. So, uh, well, it says they move off at speeds V1 and V2 at equal angles either side of the initial direction. OK, so what does that mean? So that's going to be going at this angle. Let's call that theta. That's V1. And this one, I'll kind of have them to going off together. All right. That's at angle also theta, and that's at V2. OK, so there we are. There's my initial direction, something like that. Right, so and I think we have a, a coordinate system, X and Y, that will allow us to explain this stuff. So uh, we've got two conservation laws here. We've got conservation of energy and conservation of momentum. So let's conserve momentum first. Right, so even if we're not sure how to proceed, uh, let's generate some equations, some laws of physics, and then hopefully uh, we'll get this sort of ratio um, yeah, some will pop out. So, that's, so we've got to have a good to take a bit of a leap of faith here. So let's go in the x direction. So that means parallel to the x direction. So what have we got? We've got m1u must equal uh, m1 cos theta v or v1 cos theta. So if you are one of the younger audience as we have here, just remember if we have a vector quantity, let's call that v1, and that's theta, we can resolve that we can make literally a vector sum of a velocity v1 cos theta in this direction and let's go for a different color a velocity v1 sine theta in that direction all right so it's literally a tip to tail sum of two vectors the uh, sort of multicolored ones the blue green one equals the red one and okay so let's go add that so that's the first one and then we've also got plus m2 m2 cos theta I'll multiply that by the V, so V2 cos theta. All right, so that's momentum in the X direction. All right, let's do the Y direction. What have we got? Well, zero to start off with, and then we've got M1 V1 sine theta. And by the way, uh, an obvious thing, momentum is mass times velocity. <laughs> I just thought, this here? I think we all know this, but just in case you don't, uh, mass times velocity is momentum in a classical world slightly different in relativistic physics okay all right i don't think we need the air quotes really how about there okay so m1 v1 sine theta and then of course we've got a negative amount of momentum in the y direction for the other one m2 v2 sine theta all right uh okay so that's equation one equation two so before we try and do something with it, let's uh, let's write down our third, which is to conserve energy. So all those you said elastic collisions are 
where your kinetic energy is conserved. Let's use that. So conserve uh, energy. And that's kinetic energy since elastic. OK. If you've been doing these calculations uh, in general, um, we might want to use the idea of a coefficient of restitution, which is the speed of separation over the speed of approach. And that's a much easier way of modeling um, more general collisions, um, simply because it's a linear thing rather than a, you know, a half mv squared thing. All right. So it makes the algebra a bit easier. But in this case, uh, let's let's use this in terms of the spirit of what it's got. So that means a half m1 u squared is equal to half m2 v1 squared plus a half m2, oops, that should be m1, m2 v2 squared. That's equation number three. Right, let's go and put some boxes around there because that's that's the, those are the key. That's the physics, basically. Right, now let's eyeball what we've got. Do we, is there anything we can use that's useful here? Well, actually, number two, we can spot that. So what we've got is V2. All right, the sine theta is the same. So V2 is going to be M1. If we put that to the other side, M1, V1 over M2. Okay, so the ratio of the masses times V1. I might leave it like that, actually. Okay, so that's really useful. Okay, uh, now what have we got? So um, if we use that, we can put that into the first equation and that tells us what uh, V1 is and V2 are in terms of the angles. And then if we stick that into the energy equation, that's probably going to tell us something involving angles. So let's have a look. What's the largest ratio for the equal angle condition that can occur? So that's kind of consistent, isn't it? We want some equation for the angle in terms of the ratio of the masses. So that's kind of what we want. All right. So what do we want? We want for here, we want um, some sort of equation equa or theta involving m1 over m2. So that means we don't want v1 or v2 there. We need to eliminate v1 and v2. So there we go. We've got a sort of uh, um, algebraic scheme now. So let's uh, let's let's get an expression for v2 in terms of of angles, um, and maybe we can get v1 and v2, etc., and then substitute into three, and that will give us our formula that we want. So let's go and do that. So if we insert V2 as M1 over M2 and V1 into equation one, we can solve that for V1. So let's go and do that now. So what we got, we could say in equation one, so we've got M1U equals M1 V1 cos theta plus M2. And now we've got, I'll do this in a different color, M1 over M2 V1 cos theta. All right. So let's factor out some uh, some V1s. What have we got here? Um, so if we, in fact, if we divide everything by M1, that's a factor. All right. Um, so if we take out the factor V1 cos theta, we've got U is V1 cos theta. And how many have we got? Uh, we've got one of those. And uh, we've got, uh, U, do, 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 well, I've got an M1 missing here. What have I done? Oh, no, that's fine. That's good. All right, uh, that's good. And in fact, M2 is now cancel for this one as well. So that's in fact even simpler. What have we got? We've got 2V1 cos theta. Therefore, V1 is my initial speed divided by 2 times the cos cosine of the angle. Brilliant. Right, and now we can use uh, this one. We'll call that equation 4, shall we? Let's have that in red. Let's have that equation in red. So uh, in 4... Uh, notice also the good discipline here. I'm writing in the margin uh, the equations I'm using because we've got three. Well, we've got four equations now. <laughs> so we want to keep track of what you're doing. If you were to look at a sort of scientific paper or a book, uh, you'll find there's loads of equations that they'll number. And so we ought to have the same. Otherwise, we don't get lost. So what we've got. So V2 is equal to M1 over M2 V1, which is U over 2 cos theta. Brilliant. Right. Now we're cooking on the gas. We've got V1 and V2. We don't really worry about these. It's the equation for our uh, angles that we want in terms of the ratio of the masses. And all we need to do is substitute those into three um, because that's definitely going to have one of those. So um, uh, let's just go and do it. All right. So uh, in equation three, this is the energy one. We've got a half M1 U squared, a half M1. Now V1 squared, so that's U squared on 4 cos squared theta plus a half m2 
b2 squared so that's going to be m1 squared on m2 squared u squared on 4 cos squared theta now the thing we want to be thinking about when you're substituting these is think about the substitution and not simplify it yet if you try and do both at the same time chances are you're going to make a mistake somewhere um, in computer programming, we talk about this as you're writing new stuff, you're adding features, and then you refactor, which is a very sort of boring word for sort of tidying things up. So add new stuff and then tidy up a bit later. Now let's do our tidying up. So what have we got? Uh, we've got, uh, let's see what we can cancel. We've got a u squared, which we can get rid of. Excellent. Uh, we've got a half, which we can get rid of. Uh, we've got an m1, which we can get rid of here. And then see what we've got left. So we've got one equals a one over four. In fact, we can get a four, four cos squared theta. We can push the other side. So four cos squared theta. What have we got left? We've got a one plus and we've got a, oh, and I've not spotted an M2. We can get rid of as well. And that's one plus M1 over M2. Uh, great. And there we go. Now we've got something beautifully simple which we can now uh, relate to our question. So what was the original question? It said, what is the largest ratio for what this equal angle condition can occur? So we want the biggest value of M1 over M2. So therefore, M1 over M2 is uh, four cos squared theta minus one. So what's the biggest value that cos squared theta can be? Let's pop that in the chat, please. How are we doing, Nina? Mm, we're getting a lot of ones. Excellent. OK, because cos theta, we had that from the beginning. All right, there's cos theta. And if we square that, let's have it down here. There we go. <laughs> there we are. OK. So, brilliant. So the largest value um, is going to be of m1 over m2 is going to be four minus one, which is three. OK, so there we go. And there is a second part of this question, which is if M1 is M2, what's the largest angle for this equal angle condition? Well, that's a nice, easy one, isn't it? So um, so uh, if we've got, uh, sorry, M1 is M2, should I say? Um, right. OK, we can just rearrange that now. So let's go part two. So if M1 equals M2, Therefore, 4 cos squared theta is 1 plus 1, which is 2. Therefore, cos squared theta is 2 over 4, or a half. Therefore, cos theta is 1 over root. And I'm hoping immediately, particularly if any of my further mathematicians are on the call, uh, what angle is that? Yep, 45. Excellent, oh. yep. So, you know, know, know your special triangles. So root two, cos 45, or indeed sine 45 is one. So cos 45 degrees equals one over root two. Excellent. There we go. Brilliant. Right. So um, we've got probably some time uh, to do the last bit. Um, do we have any questions on, on this or anything else uh, before I proceed with that last one? Nope. Right. OK, so. Right. OK, so there we go. And I think um, I probably haven't got time to sort of select my my top tips for, for next week. So what we'll do is um, I will I'll have a selection and the lovely Lena Shams will then email those to you with the invite next week. Um, but basically, I would if you want to have a bit of practice, have a work through the paper and do the easiest ones you can find. Um, so uh, uh, let's go for W. This is the one I want to have a look at now. All right. Should be scrolling down here. W. Yeah, let's find that. OK, that's a nice one. W, there we go. Right. OK, so we've got a, a radiation question. Um, am I still live, guys? Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> right. So we're going to do the same kind of thing. So uh, let's have a look. So we've got uh, we've got an alpha particle, which is ejected from um uranium-238 nucleus, all right? So although this is radioactivity, same laws of physics, conservation of momentum. All right, so let's go for before. 
let's apply what we've done here. So we've got a uranium nucleus. All right. And then afterwards, that has decayed to thorium going uh, with momentum, P thorium, and helium with momentum, uh, P helium. Now, why have I done momentum? Well, well, the reason is, is that momentum has got to be conserved. Uh, we've not been given. Well, we actually we have been given the masses. This. We, we could do this. Um, but also um, in terms of sort of the kinetic energy, it would make kind of sense rather than we haven't got velocities here that we're using. That would be a bit unwieldy. It might be easier to think of it in terms of momentum. So there's, uh, if you've not met this yet, the kinetic energy of a particle or anything is P squared on 2M. Very useful, that is. We can quickly derive that by saying P is MV. Right. And kinetic energy, at least in classical terms, is a half mv squared. Right. So if we square my my, my, my momentum, that's m squared v squared. So we divide by by m. So p squared on m is going to be mv squared. And therefore, p squared on 2m is a half mv squared. All right. So really useful rearrangement. All right. Because we don't want to find the velocity. All right. Um, there we go. Don't want to find velocities. OK. All right. I suppose we could, but that would be unwieldy. So by conservation of momentum, given we were stationary. Right. So that's after. Uh, OK. Let's have a. OK, then then PT must equal PHE. All right because they are conserved. So if we, and we can call this the zero momentum frame, which is a really useful concept uh, for doing collisions. Okay, but uh, so rather than, you know, considering a frame with uranium atom is somehow moving, let's just see what's stationary. I mean, this question, that's kind of natural really, um, but uh, that's actually a very good idea in general. Okay, so um, this will basically give us by conservation of momentum, By conservation of momentum, we know that the numerical value of momentum of the thorium atom must be the momentum of the helium atom. Right now, if we do energy conservation, we've got something even more interesting. OK. Right. So uh, we have to include all the masses of the particles. And we know that we've got some sort of a. Uh, you know, the, the, mass, <laughs> the masses are kind of conserved, if you like. So what we can do is we can use uh, equals mc squared to work this out. All right. So if we do energy conservation, the mass of the uranium atom times c squared, the rest mass energy, if you like, is the mass of the thorium times c squared plus the mass of the helium atom times c squared. And the difference in their masses is now where the kinetic energy comes from. Do you think about it? Um, how can we have a stationary atom that now moves that corresponds to two atoms which are moving? How does that work if the mass is the same? All right. So somehow we must gain some energy in this system. All right. And that energy ultimately is going to be coming from the masses of the particles. You kind of drill that down. We can talk about something called a binding energy. But essentially, it's from the mass. You know, from a classical physics perspective, there's nothing else going on. So we've traded some of the mass. We've lost some of the mass of the uranium. And that's now turned into the kinetic energy of the bits. So what have we got? We've got P thorium squared on 2M thorium. Uh, and what we've got, I think I'm going to call that a T. That's all right. OK, and I've got the P helium squared on 2M helium. All right. So that's my energy conservation. Right. And what is it we want? Uh, term the kinetic energy of the emitted alpha particle in mega electron volts. All right. So this is what we want here. We want this. All right. And there's a uh, we have to convert an energy in joules to mega electron volts. We'll get there eventually. So um, if we uh, we know that uh, P helium is equal to P thorium. So we can put that in there. So let's uh, let's uh, let's sort of uh, let's sort of put that all together. So therefore, uh, what have we got? We've got some um, uh, which one should we do? So we'll go for the differences in the masses. So MU minus M thorium minus M helium. I'm going to multiply that by C squared. And on this one, we've got um, P 
uh, he. I'm going to replace this one in here. OK, uh, I'll square that. And I'll divide it by 2m helium. That's what we want. So if we factor that out, what have I got now? I've basically got uh, one of these. Um, let's just, just check I've got that right. Yeah, so if I've got one of these, I've got one from here. All right, and what have I got on the other side? Um, I've got m helium divided by m thorium. Let's check I've got that right. So if I multiply that back through, I cancel the m helium, I've got the m thorium, and there we go. All right, so I want the, this particular ratio. So therefore, the momentum of the helium atom divided by twice the mass of the helium atom. That's the kinetic energy of the alpha particle. Good to remind yourself of that. And then we've got the difference in the mc squareds, right, divided by this mass ratio thing. OK, and that's not something that would be obvious, I think, if you were to just work that out. OK, uh, we need a c squared as well. Right. So that's if we put all the numbers in. Now, let's just have a look. What we've got it. We've got in kilograms. We've got the speed of light. So what we need to do is convert that to mega electron volts. So one MeV is going to be 10 to the six times the charge on the electron in joules, because we've got the idea of the charge on the electron times the voltage, the energy per unit charge. If uh, that's one volt, uh, that will be one point six times 10 to the minus 19 joules. So not a lot, but we're talking electrons here. So 10 to the 6 times 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. That's one mega electron volt. So if we stick in the numbers, I think I've got time just to substitute that. So that equals um, 3.85395. It's a bit of a pain, this one, because the numbers are very precise. But we've got to use the differences. So it's a small difference. 78737. Uh, mass of this one. So what have we got? 6.64807. I'm going to divide it by 100. It's another little gotcha here. So if you look at the mass of this one, uh, 10 to the minus 27. All right. So uh, that uh, is all times 10 to the minus kilograms. And we multiply that by the speed of light. Squared. And I'm going to divide that by my mass ratio. So one plus, well, we've got the helium one is 6.64807. Uh, and then we've got the 100, can remember it's 10 to the minus 27, times 3.78737. That's this one here, the uh, thorium one. This one here. So we've got a slightly awkward little calculation. That's in joules. Uh, so I work that to be 8.77 times 10 to the minus 13 joules. So if we divide that by this number of, of joules, that works out to be 5.48 mega electron volts. What's rather interesting about alpha decay um, is that uh, because there's only one particle that's produced, they all have the same energy. And if you think about it, there's nothing to do with the sort of um, you know, motion of the particles, etc. That is the energy of the alpha particle. So they always have the same. Whereas beta, a bit more interesting than that, a beta particle, again, aside, is where a neutron goes to a uh, proton, all right, plus an electron, all right, and something called an electron antineutrino, which is this thing here. Almost no mass um, and no charge, but the this particular thing will randomly share the kinetic energy between the beta particle, the electron, and the electron antineutrino. There's a spectrum of energies for beta, whereas for alpha particles, that is not the case. OK, uh, thank you very much indeed. We are bang on nine o'clock. Um, we could quickly field a few questions. Other than that, uh, thank you so much for listening. I'm very, very sorry that I dipped out for a few minutes at the beginning. Uh, we'll sharpen that up for next time. Uh, and uh, hopefully we can cut that from the video so it will be even slicker. Ha. Uh, any questions before we go? There's one person. No, you still Oh, there's yep. one person asking about the kind of the energy balance saying, OK, we're just assuming that all the like mass, di the difference from the mass loss is the kinetic energy. And like there's. Yes. So... Go on. No, sorry. No, no. 
Yeah. So I think, yeah, you could say, OK, well, what about gamma rays, for example? You know, maybe there's some gamma rays emitted. Well, um, it's it would it says it's according to this, it's an alpha decay. So if we sort of think about GCSE sort of uh, physics and this one, alpha, beta and gamma. So, yeah, in general, maybe you could have a more exotic decay that it could. You know, it's not changed. We can't, haven't got we can't have a change in nuclear number. Um, you know, we still got to have that. Um, we still got a balanced charge. Um, but we might have some gamma rays as well, potentially, you know, some electromagnetic rays. So uh, we kind of have to assume in this question that doesn't happen. It's, an, it's a pure alpha decay. So if that's the case, uh, the only things that we can possibly do for our energy balance are the MC squareds, you know, the rest mass energy uh, from Einstein's equation and kinetic energy. Uh, the, I suppose the gotcha is, is that uh, uh, we're going to assume classical physics. OK, <laughs> we're not going <clears> to. <throat> we can do this with relativistic things, but that's uh, we'd have to give you those formulae because uh, that's uh, not going to be assumed. OK, for interest, what we would do, the kinetic energy is gamma minus one MC squared. Well, gamma is the relativistic factor. One minus V squared on C squared the minus the half. But then we have to think about how we turn that into momentum. So there's all sorts of fun we can have. It can be done. But uh, uh, we're going to assume the, these uh, classical physics, the velocities are not going to be relativistic ones, i.e. much, much, uh, not, not, not much smaller than the speed of light. OK, uh, any more questions before we go? Can you just scroll down to show the final answer again? Oh, of course. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a slightly sort of a, a, a slightly nasty bit of arithmetic for this one. Another great reason why you want to stay algebraic, because you could you could get down. It'd be very easy if you're in a rush to miss a few decimal places and get a slightly different answer. I'm sure we'd either give you full marks or uh, or maybe just doc one. Uh, if you got, I know, 5.17 mega electron volts or something like this, if your expression, this one was right. You know, that's really what we want. OK. Obviously, answers are important, by the way. <laughs> so, uh, you know, if you uh, end up as a particle physicist, you know, and uh, or an engineer, you know, the actual numbers are, are are important in reality. But, uh, you know, for the purposes of, uh, of what we're trying to achieve, um, it's the formula that we want. OK, um, I think that's probably it. Thank you very much indeed for bearing with us. And uh, I will see you at the same time uh, next week.